here today. Missing the Bombas. You know, we had uh, Daniela here yesterday with her cello. Got her in over Christmas, and man, what a great addition that is. But, can't uh, wait yeah. to get them back, huh? Yeah, can't wait to get them back. Stand with us this morning. We're going to need all your help, right? <laughs> Jump in. Sing with us this morning. I can see the clouds roll in. I can feel the wind as it try to shake me. I will not be moved. My feet are on the rock. The waters rise. I can hear the howling of lies that haunt me. Fear will hold me now. My feet are on the rock. In a few, my hope about to rain. I will cling to your unchanging grace. Let the water. together. Help us with this today. I can see the morning light. I can feel the joy on the horizon. Here my faith is found. I stand on solid ground. It's when I feel my whole about to rain. I will bring you your changing grace. Let the waters come and the earth give away. I'll be dancing in the rain. Feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet, clap your hands. Our feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand to stomp your feet. Clap your hands, the feet are on the rock. When I feel my hope about to rain, I will cling to your unchanging grace. Let the waters come and the earth give away. I'll be dancing in the rain. A feet are on the rock. Time. And when I feel my hope about to rain, I will cling to your unchanging grace. Let the waters come and the earth give away. I'll be dancing in the rain. My feet are on the rock. Good song. We're gonna we're gonna avoid the. Uh, the hugs and the handshakes today just to, you know, you know. It's not because we don't love each other. Best hug in church in town, but hey. <clears throat> Stay with us, right? Here's another one I like. This is a good old song. The Lord's our rock. In him we hide. Shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied. Shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary land. A weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night. Shelter in the time of storm No fears of alarm, no foes of fright Shelter in the time of storm Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land A weary land in my weary land Jesus is a rock in a weary land He's a shelter in the time of storm Another verse in you? Try this. The raging storm may round us beat. Shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat. Shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A weary land in my weary is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. If 
there were five verses to this. It'd be so fast you couldn't sing it. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, rock divide. Oh, refuge dear. Shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near. Shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in my weary land. In my weary land. A weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. He is shelter in the time of storm. I'll see you one more time. can have a seat this morning <coughs> keep singing with us I don't know some of those songs you just sing them <laughs> you start them and they just get going you know what I mean Harry? I don't suppose there's anything wrong with that I'm just thinking you know when we get to heaven you're doing one for eternity how quick could it be by the time you wrap it try this one with us this morning I love this song it says Lord you're my treasure Faithful Lord, please fill my cup with your grace and love, your grace and love. The treasures that this world's full of, they could never be enough, oh, never be enough. Cause I've created you, oh Lord, bought with the price I'm not my own, seated in the heavenly. There's no place I'd rather be than with you time that you've given us to come and gather in this place. Lord, lift our praise and our worship to you this morning. Grateful for, Lord, all of the blessings you've bestowed upon us in this past year. And Lord, I know sometimes it's easier to, to see the struggles and the difficulties, but God, you've blessed us and we're here this morning. We have breath in our lungs. So Lord, we give you all of our praise. We give you all of our thanks for your faithfulness. God, just pray that you'd be with those who are not able to be here today. God, give them strength in their bodies. Bring them back to us. 
But Lord, in this time that we had together this morning as a congregation, just fill us up, Lord, with more and more of you. Give us the strength we need for the new year that's just ahead. Lord, I'm so grateful that, that we don't have to take it on all at one time, but just one day at a time. And Lord, in those new days that we get, Lord, your mercies are new every single day. So we thank you, Lord, for your provision. Give us what we need for today and, and Lord, for this the remainder of this day that you'll give us, God, that we might uh, have those opportunities to reach out in our community. Lord, if it's at lunch today, if it's with our, our neighbors, our friends, our family throughout the remainder of the day, God, give us those words that we need to encourage and comfort others who are around about us, and Lord, to lead them to a place, Lord, where they'll put you uh, first in their lives and seek you. Lord, we thank you for it. We give you the day. Use it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a great song, and I gotta be honest with you, I never sang it till I moved here. Hmm. Never did, never, never sang this one till I moved here. But I was just going through songs one day and picking up old songs, you know? And I, I love the new ones. We sang some new ones today, and we're singing some old ones today. There's something about putting those together for me that really works. Hmm. And I know there's places all over the world that make choices and say we're going to do the new ones or we're going to do the old we're going to do them both we'll put them all together but we need these old songs you know uh, it connects us you know what I mean to those who have gone before us generations of folks have sung songs like this and we're about to sing this morning and I uh, won't get into all the details with this but something that made this song stand out to me was a group that was worshiping in North Korea back in the 40s. And of course, they were routing out, finding believers, Christians, trying to remove that from a communist regime that was taken over there. But they found a group, a church that was worshiping together, and they told the parents that they'd give them a final chance to, to renounce their faith, to come alongside, and if they wouldn't do that, that they would take the lives of their children. There was one mama in a group with her little babies that day, and she told one of her babies, she was heard saying, I will see you in heaven today. Took the life of the little ones and gave the adults one final chance to save their own lives. And guys, they sang this song as they were taking their lives. The song just says, Lord, more love to thee. Yeah, and I... I Hear a song like that, and I, I can't pass it up. i got to bring it this morning. We've got to sing it together. What we do, can we just sing the words to him, make it our prayer today? More love to you, Lord. <laughs> I just, before this day is over, Lord, I want to love you more. I love the words. It goes like this. More love to thee, O oh Christ. More love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make on bending knee. This is my earnest plea. More love, O oh Christ, to thee. More love to thee. More love to thee. Earth, the joy I craved sought peace and rest. Now, thee alone I seek, give what is best. This all my prayer shall be more love, O Christ. Shall my latest breath 
whisper thy praise. This be the parting cry my heart shall raise. This till my prayer shall be more love, O oh Christ. Still my prayer shall be singing again. This still my prayer shall be more love, O Christ, to thee, more love to thee, oh more love to thee. One more time, more love. Sing more love to thee. to see the ones who were able to make it here for Christmas Eve candlelight service. And I know a lot of people wanted to come and able to for various reasons, but uh, it was a wonderful night. <clears throat> I sat with a couple pastor friends at lunch not too long back uh, downtown, and I had not really met either one of them. They're fairly new to town. Got talking and one of them said, hey, I'm doing a, I'm doing a, a study through Philippians and a, I'm doing a series. What do you think about doing series? And got talking, the guy next to him said, well, I'm doing a series too and it's also out of Philippians. We got talking a little bit more and realized, you know, as always is the case, they were approaching it from slightly different angles, slightly different uh, uh, approaches to to sharing that sermon series, and then one of them turns and said, well, are you, are you doing any of that kind of stuff? I said, well, I've been doing a series on Jesus Is, and we started last January, and here we are the last Sunday of December. So for a year, it's, it's a little lengthier than, than the six weeks or so. Within that, you can do a series of things as you study through Scripture, which we have done. Today, I want to look at a passage that comes out of Hebrews 12, verse 2, and again, Hebrews lays out Christ as our high priest, as our redeemer, as the one who died for our sins and is evermore the intercessor of our, uh, uh, for our faith. As uh, the writer of Hebrews is laying this out in a very, very logical way, I would take the book of Hebrews and summarize the entire book this way. Jesus is greater than. That's what that book is about. He's greater than the angels, he's greater than Moses, greater than Melchizedek, greater than the law. He's greater than all because he is the source of all. So that's what the book of Hebrews is about and it lays it within the context of who he is versus who we are, which we find in Romans. So as we look at this passage in Hebrew, it says this, to us, looking unto Jesus, the author of and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now be careful, don't make that geographical, okay? It's a location of sphere of operation, and that's, uh, if you want to discuss that sometime one-on-one, -on -one, I'd love to do that. So let's take some notes. Jay, you got your pen ready? Hopefully everybody got a bulletin as you came in, a place to, to take some notes. Let's start out with this. We look unto Jesus with the spiritual eye. It's the eye of faith. That word faith should be underlined, I think. Is that a blank on your sheet or not? Yeah. I don't know if that's the first version or the second or the third. Or <laughs> okay. We look unto Jesus with the spiritual eye, not with the physical eye. He's not here. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, he told his disciples. That's us. That's all of those generations that have come between then and now and on into the future as long as that 
exist. So when we talk about Christ, we're not just talking about facts of who he is, although that's important, because whatever those facts are have to be seen through the spiritual eye. We also have to see through the eye of faith, but faith is not empty faith. Faith is not faith in my faith. Faith is not, well, I just believe that's what I think it is. It's not that at all. Faith is based upon substance and reality, and that is what the scriptures teach us, who Jesus is. So let's fill in, let's, let me read Ephesians, and then we'll fill in our second one there. The eyes, this is Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus. And he's praying for them. This is part of his prayer. I'd encourage you to go back and read the entire prayer later on, maybe before this day is over. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Okay? Your spiritual eye. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You can read the scripture just as reading a book. But if you don't read it with spiritual eyes and with the eye of faith, it won't make any sense to you. And you can only read with spiritual eyes and the eyes of faith as one who has accepted Christ, who then has the Holy Spirit living in you because he is the teacher, the comforter, the one who guides us in all truth. And so the lost person, while they can read scripture and get some benefit out of it, they will simply be viewing it from worldly eyes, from the eyes of their own experience and understanding and not through the eyes of spiritual understanding, not through the eye of faith. So our first bullet is this. Our spiritual eye sees what the scripture teaches concerning Jesus. It amazes me that in many places of faith, I'll go ahead and call them Christians because I don't know for a fact that they are or not. I just know that some of the stuff that's being taught is not from the Bible and being passed off as spiritual stuff, as deep stuff, as special stuff, and it really isn't because ultimately you can only see Jesus not as you want to see him but as the Scripture presents him. So let's, let me get you started on a list and you can finish it later. Who is Jesus? We asked that question a while back. He is God incarnate who took on flesh. That's what incarnation means, to take on flesh. God, the creator of all, became part of his own creation. Only God could do that. And he remained 100% God and yet 100% human being, the incarnate Christ. As he lived in this world and he chose to be born in this world just as we were. He could have just appeared. Right? So when we get into all this philosophical religious stuff, we're going to end up with some really bad Bible teaching. Well, maybe God's a woman. I wonder, I wonder what race God is. You see where this can go off the cliff real quick? God presents himself as the eternal God who has no beginning, who has no end. He is the first cause that created everything else. So you can't ask the question, who made God? Because then you've just redefined God. God, by definition, always has been, always will be, unchanging, immutable, always eternal. That's how it always has been. Otherwise, you're talking about something else. So we only learn that from Scripture. You cannot learn that from any other philosophy or world religion that has ever existed in all of history. None of them but the Scripture teaches that God himself took on flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, verse 14, John 1, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld him as the only begotten of God, full of grace and truth. I'm not free to make up Jesus into whatever image I want him to be. I'm not free to make up God into whatever image I want him to be. He is who he always has been. And the only way to find out who he has always been is we turn to Scripture and we begin to study it 
And we begin to ask as a believer who now has the Holy Spirit within, show me, teach me, guide me. David, that question you asked me a couple weeks ago, I'm still pondering it. I'm still, I'm still rattling around in my head and going, okay, I think that was probably partly right, but I'm not done with it yet. I want to keep working through it. We should always, all of us be doing that, be what we would call Bereans, where we, we hear what is said of God in his word in the gospel, but, but then we, we individually go back to scripture and we, and we search to see if those things are right and so. Because if we're all led by the one Holy Spirit, ultimately we all have to. It's not an option. We all have to come to the same conclusion or it doesn't mean anything. If you can come to your truth and I can come to my truth and we all have our own truth, then truth doesn't mean anything. It means whatever you want it to be. If your faith is not biblically based, as the scriptures describes faith, then it's just a faith that you have created and you begin to have faith in your faith. And then you start defining it however you want it to be. And pretty soon God becomes the one you pray to because you have problems and you want him to give you stuff, you want him to take away bad stuff, you want him there when you want him there, you don't want him there when you don't want him there. And pretty soon, hey, I've got this all flip-flopped upside down. And I can't study scripture to find what I want it to be, what I want it to say. That's why I really got stuck about a month ago on the Great Commission. And I walked out of here that day just rattling in my head and going, it's not hard, but it's profound. And what I find myself doing is making excuses for why that is not so or that is not so, but I'm not given that option. So I have to come back to what Christ has said. I have to come back to teach disciples to obey all those things that he taught, not just what I want to obey, not just the hardest thing of, of teaching and preaching God's word is you got to deal with stuff that you don't want to deal with. There's a lot of verses that I would rather skip because I don't like them because I pretty much know exactly what they say. I just don't want to do it. Anybody else have that problem? Don't raise your hand. We all do. Our spiritual eye through Scripture, through the Holy Spirit teaching and guiding, over time, over study, over the changing of our hearts, over the transformation of our minds, being continually renewed by God's Word, that's what begins to reveal Jesus. Stan, I remember years ago we had a discussion about, you know, doing the traveling overseas and stuff. And one of the things that we tend to want to do is take away the struggle for people. We want to fix things. We want to make sure everything's in good order so that people don't have to go and fuss and fight and deal with, you know, stuff. Especially international travel can get messed up in a hurry, in a heartbeat. And to come to the conclusion that, you know, we should stop trying to take the struggle out of stuff. Let people struggle. So, pastor friend that's not here any longer, but years ago we sat, and he said, you know, I'm of a different application of my faith than you in many areas. But people will come up and say, well, pastor, I want you to pray for me. He says, okay, you know. I'm going to do it with Gary real quick. Okay, Gary's come up and said, pray with me. Lord, have at him in Jesus' name. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> you, feel comf- you feel comforted? <laughs> You're okay with that? That's truly how it should be. You know, when we come here and we share every Sunday the struggles and this and that, you know, my, my heart gets broken when I look and I see the struggles represented in this room, but I can't fix a single one of them, and I shouldn't try to. And, and you should be allowed to struggle, but also know that people are concerned about you and, and, and love you and want to pray for you and this and that, but again, we can't fix anything and we can't change anything. So, Lord, just have out of all of us. Do what you want to do. Jesus helped people struggling, but he didn't help everybody. 
He healed people, but he didn't heal everybody. He called out to everybody to follow him, but they didn't all follow him. As we begin to study scripture, and I was looking this last week, and I think this is maybe where I'm going to go in the future for a while. And I, and I got thinking, you know, I really don't know the book of Acts very well. And gee whiz, that's the beginning of the history of the church and what happened. And there's, there's a lot of key stuff in there. There's a lot, of, there's a lot of, of stories within the story within the story. And what I was doing is I was chasing a study on apostleship because of the new apostolic reformation, Chris, that we've dealt with. It's, it, it's, it's become a plague on the church, and it is worldwide. And I've seen it in, in, in Central America. I've seen it over in India. I've seen it ac across the land here where there's this, this, this new thing God is doing. No, he isn't. God is always doing what he's done. What do you mean a new thing? Maybe a new understanding of an old thing, but not a new thing, not a new outpouring, but simply people coming to their senses, to where they should have been in the first place. That's not a new movement. That's not a new outpouring. That's God's people simply turning back to Scripture and waking up and going, oh, that's what's going on. And we get back to foundational stuff instead of all the craziness that's out there in Facebook and YouTube land that passes itself off as the Christian faith and scriptural teaching, because it's not. Okay, did you, that was an unsolicited political announcement. Almost got my motor wound right there, because that stuff can wind me up pretty quick. Because it, 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 it hurts so many people along the way. They're not looking to scripture to see what it teaches about Jesus. They're just making up all this new stuff and turn it into, I just called it for years, Christian magic. I don't know what else to call it. Luke 24, 15 and 16, and it came to pass that while they communed, this is the road to Emmaus, the disciples walking along. Christ has already been crucified. Resurrection has already come, but they're not understanding what this is. So these are two Disciples who are distraught. Jesus is gone. Maybe we misunderstood everything. And Jesus appears to him on the road, and this is part of the story. Again, go back and read the whole story. I'm not printing the whole thing out here. This is a piece, okay? It came to pass... While they communed together, we would call that talking, okay? They were talking along the road. And they reasoned... Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden. Their eyes were made blind. They simply could not understand. They were not seeing with the spiritual eye. They were not seeing with the eye of faith. They were distraught and disturbed. Their Lord had been killed mercilessly and put in a grave. And that was the end of the story as far as they were concerned. Their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And then you go on down, that's verse 15, 16, go on down to 31 because it's a remarkable passage that says Jesus started saying, well, well what's going on, guys? They said, are you the only one in town that doesn't know what's going on? Where have you been? And they told him about the crucifixion and all that. And then it says, and then Jesus beginning with the prophets, and all of the scriptures, all of the Old Testament, what a, what a conversation. He went from the beginning to the end of the Old Covenant and said, and that scripture is about me, and that's about me, and that's about me, and that's about me, and that's about me. And here's what happened as Jesus began to be the Bible teacher. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. You can't have your spiritual eyes open in the eye of faith opened unless you turn back to scripture and begin to study and learn how to study and learn how to approach it and there's there's there are ways to do that and there are not good ways to do that either god can still use them you know if how you approach the bible is like a kindergartner that's still better than nothing but it would be good to not stay in kindergarten and get a little bit more how we approach scripture and what do we do with that their eyes were open and they knew him and then he vanished out of their sight. 
What a Bible study that was. They were just walking down the road, and here comes Jesus and says, you know, all of this is about me. And their eyes were opened, and everything was different from that day forward. When you gave your life to Christ, assuming you have, and you were born again, and his spirit was given to you, that was the beginning of your Christian journey, of your discipleship journey. And many people stay as little babies in the faith because they're never fed. And then sometimes when they are fed, they don't want to chew and swallow and digest it. And as we begin to learn that that is the bread of life, Christ is the bread of life come down from heaven, and this is the bread of life, the written the written uh, history, written story of who Christ is. When we begin to do that, God begins to show us stuff. And he doesn't do it through all this nonsense on TV. Now, this is if, if you're one who loves this stuff, okay, just tuck in your toes a little bit. I'm sort of sorry, but not a whole lot, okay? I just don't watch Christian TV and radio very, very rarely. There is good stuff there. But a lot of it, it's just messing people up. Uh, that's what I would call it. Yeah. And so what happens is there's this stuff that's being taught with, with a lot of flair and a lot of, you know, I mean, I'm just amazed that these guys can fill stadiums up over and over and over again with people who uh, keep getting, they keep asking questions, you're given a bad answer, things don't work out, and they come back again and ask for more garbage because that's what's happening. Rather than going back to Scripture, let's see who he says he is, and as he begins to teach his word, your last bullet under one, our spiritual eyes sees the truth of Christ through faith in him. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the bread of life. He is the redeemer. He is the lamb of God. He is, we could just fill up literally a yellow pad. Anybody still use those? I do every now and then. You could just fill it up with who Jesus is. Have to get another pad out. So we look unto Jesus for who he says he is as scripture reveals him not as we think he should be, who we think he might be, but as he really is. And when we begin to find the Jesus of the Bible, I'm telling you, your world will flip upside down pretty quick. Second part. <laughs> Did you catch me? Second part. <laughs> we look unto Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. That's how that verse began. The word for author means the one who causes, the cause. Jesus is the cause of salvation. He's the beginner. He's the starter. He's the one who, who, who puts it together, who conceives it. Does that make sense? Come up with whatever other synonyms you need in there. So we look to Jesus as the author, the one who causes and begins our faith, and we also look to him as the finisher, and that means the one who brings to consummation or a conclusion. My salvation has a beginning when I was born again accepting Christ. My salvation will have an ending when he takes me home and actually the end is an eternal end. The consummation of this world is the end of here, but the beginning of what really matters, of what is really eternal. And to that, there's no end to it. So that's who we're looking to Jesus as, the one who is the cause and beginner and the one who will finish and consummate and bring it to a conclusion of my faith. 1 Peter 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled, 
and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. For those old enough to remember in school and who used to be taught how to diagram sentences, that's a doozy. Those three verses are one sentence. And it breaks it off into three separate areas. And it tells us again who Christ is, what he has done, where we are going in verse four, in verse four, and in verse five is the conclusion, the end of where this all ends up. Because of the resurrection of Christ, the now God-man, incarnate God, we have the hope of the resurrection. Death has been conquered. The grave has been conquered. We as human beings on this planet still have to die. And the last enemy that we will face is death. So don't look at death as your friend apart from it's, it's, it's the way to get home. But it is an enemy. And oftentimes I hear people say, and maybe we think this because we've heard it or been taught, well, you know, it's just the normal course of, uh, of life. No. The wages of sin is death. That's why there's death, because sin is there. That's why we die. It's not the normal thing. That is not how Adam and Eve were created. They were not created to die. But when they sinned against God, that's the outcome. And so all of us have to die. And some will go rather peacefully, and some not so. Some will go rather quickly, and some not so. Some will go early, and some not so. But all of us, because of sin in this world and sin within, the wages of sin is death, even for the believer. I've noticed through uh, the years that faith healers tend to die pretty much the same way that everybody else does, pretty much about the same time everybody else does. Imagine. So, that tells me the truth of all of that. It's not true. In verse 4, he talks about the outcome. We have an inheritance incorruptible. Now, be careful what you do with that because the inheritance is not a mansion in heaven. In my house, hey, I was a better Christian than you. I get a bigger mansion than you do. That's not it at all. That's geographical thinking again. Streets of gold that you can see through. Okay, we're talking about something else here. We're not talking about physical, earthly stuff at all. We are his dwelling place. We are his temple we are living stones that Christ has called and saved and redeemed and placed where he wants me to be, not where I want me to be, not where you think I ought to be, but where he wants me to be, and he dwells within us. We are the temple of God. So this idea of a mansion in heaven, that's an unfortunate translation. I know it's good old southern gospel stuff, and we can sing about it, but you know, it's not really what it's talking about. The stuff that is eternal is spiritual. It's not place. It's not stuff. Heaven is not the goal for the Christian. To be with Christ is the goal. You get heaven anyway. Christ is the cake. Heaven's the icing. We get it all. But don't confuse the two. The goal for me is not to die and go and see all my family, friends, and my dog spot and my horse, whatever you called him, and all of that stuff. It's not about that. I hope there's drums up there somewhere. Okay? And if you're a gardener, I hope there's gardens up there. And if you're whatever, whatever you like to do, I, we don't know. I do know this, that according to Scripture, we look forward to new heavens and a new earth because earthlings belong on earth but it won't be this earth. And it won't just be a repainted, varnished, cleaned up, overhauled earth either. Because this one's going to be destroyed. And Satan's going to be destroyed. And death will be destroyed. And sin will be destroyed. And no more pain. And no more sorrow. And no more tears. 
So how long are we going to have to learn a song and get it right, Stan? <laughs> I love the fact that we mess up something every single time we're together because that's how life really is, right? And verse 5 is the outcome. We are kept by the power of God through faith. It's God's power through my faith in his power, not my faith in my faith, not my faith that I've got to try hard, that I've got to be better, that I've got to do certain things. We are kept by God's power unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, the last time is not necessarily the last day, judgment day, the end of the world. The last time is the gospel era whereby spiritually, through our spiritual eyes and through our eye of faith, we understand what is happening here. God through Christ has come to redeem us. We've been living in the last days since Jesus came. Notwithstanding what the bookstore bookstore keeps telling us, right? It's been the end of everything my entire life. I just don't think it's the end yet. I hope not for my grandkids' sake and maybe their own kids and whatever I get to see before I'm gone. Jesus will reveal and has revealed through the gospel message what our salvation is all about. The gospel account gives us the content. And this is the last time. It's the gospel age, has been for 2,000 plus years. And we know what God is doing. Now, I think I corrected this a few weeks back. For a long period of my life, I would take the verse, I has not seen nor ear has heard the great things God has prepared for us. And I always took that out of context to mean we don't know what heaven's going to be like until I read, read the next verse. And why I didn't do that for 20-something years beats me. I just didn't finish the sentence. I has not seen, ear has not heard what great things God has prepared for us. But we know the great things of God because he has revealed them to us by his spirit. What is he what is the great things of God that he loves us that he has redeemed us that he is purchasing his, us back with his own blood? We know the great deep things of God. It's called the gospel message. It's not about future stuff. It's about what's already here. God so loved the world. It's already here. First bullet. As the author of my faith, Jesus then is the beginning and the source of my faith. You cannot have faith until you come to Christ. At that point, you just have religion, or you have culture, or you have something, but you don't have, you don't have saving faith. Okay? So Jesus, as the author, the cause of my faith, he is the beginning of it, and he is the source of my faith. Nicodemus, why do you not understand? You must be born again. But how can I enter into my mother's womb? That's not what I'm talking about. You come through the water, born into this world, but you must be born again by the blood coming to Christ and having your sins forgiven. And God causes you to be born again by his spirit. And you're a new creature in Christ. It's not something that we do. It's not something that religion causes to happen. It's not something that good thinking or philosophy causes to happen. It's what God causes to happen. So most of you know this, but the very first thing, the very first prayer of an unbeliever that God hears is very simple, and it is, help! It really is that simple. From my heart, I cry out for God to help me and save me. I don't understand it. I don't even know if God's there yet. I don't know what the Scripture's teaching. I'm, I don't have His Spirit. I may read the book and I'm kind of fascinated by it, but I don't know what to do with it. Not until we submit to God and cry out for help to call upon the name of the Lord, he'll answer. That does solve some other problems, right? Does God hear all prayers? Yeah, of the believers. Does he hear all prayers of the unbelievers? He hears it, but he doesn't respond in the same way until they cry out to be saved. 
then he can deal with them as a child. Till then, they're just part of the creation as a rebellious child. So he's the author and source beginning. Let's look at the second passage there in 1 Peter 1, 6 on down. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Let's put that in English. Sometimes life stinks, you know, and it's really hard. And believers get very down and discouraged, and we lose hope from time to time. And we wonder if God is still there. And we wonder why this could possibly be happening in my life. And we just get on this emotional thing. And then other times we're just high as can be. And boy, life is going our way because everything seems to be good until the bottom falls out. And that's, that's not where God wants us to be. Right now we rejoice, though now for a season, we carry heaviness. Philippians, Paul comes to a total, total different conclusion of his relationship with Christ. He says, I want to know him and his sufferings. Now, folks, that's not normal. Only by faith through God's spirit can I say those words. I do not pray for my own suffering. And yet, Paul says, that's the only way I can know him. I want to know his sufferings. I want to know that he truly died for me. I want to know the pain he went through to rescue me from myself. I want to know how he was ridiculed and mocked and deserted and forsaken by even his own inner group of disciples. I need to know that because I need to know this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. I need to know that when I'm walking close with Christ, this world will hate me because it hated him first. I need to know that when I turn my, my faith, my salvation, into the stuff of this world, I'm way off track. If you need proof of that, just go, go home and read Hebrews chapter 11. I've been through that a number of times lately. In that list of people of faith, it seems that one group is presented as winners. They're victorious. Boy, they shut the mouths of lions. They quench the fires. They, uh, they fight and win battles. Uh, their dead are raised and all of that. And they're called great people of faith. And if that's the kind of faith that we all are supposed to get, and that's all the Scripture taught, then we would all have to conclude that we have to always be victorious in this life until you read the next part of the chapter. And others were sawn in two, fed to the lions, beaten to death, driven out into the desert, mocked and ridiculed, set on fire, thrown out in the desert to die. And then the verse that really sums it all up is after that list of, gee, this is victorious, and this is not so, you know, I don't want that. And these all, people of faith, died having not received the promises because the promises are not of this world. So if I begin to analyze my faith as victories in this life, I seriously misunderstand what faith is. Anybody here not been beaten down more than once? Any of you of faith not questioned your faith from time to time? It's okay to do that. You've gone through an extreme tragedy in your life and you're wondering if this is all even real. That's, a, that's an okay place to be. Not a fun place to be, but there's nothing wrong with it. Go ahead and question everything. You're not going to change God at all. Challenge him all you want. He can take it. You can call him names if you want. Isn't that what our kids do? You're the meanest mom I've ever had. Well... <laughs> You're the, you're the worst dad in the whole wide world because you told them to do something the right way and they didn't want to do it. God can take that from his children. Every now and then he allows us to just pitch a little tantrum and have a fit and all of that and goes, okay, well, get it out of your system and then when you're ready to go again, let's go. Doesn't change him a bit. I do want to know him and his sufferings. I do want to learn how to deny myself because I'm not so good at it. 
all too often. I do want to learn how to die to myself because I'm not so good at that all too often. I want to count the cost of discipleship and realize that I will always come up empty-handed, but he has the inheritance of all the riches that I need to live a life pleasing to him. And he gave it to me at the point of my salvation. I have everything I need. I don't need anything added to it. I just need to apply it. I need to understand it. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. I haven't seen Jesus. He's never talked to me other than here, Scripture. But I still love him to the best I can understand him through Scripture. Though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's hard to explain how good Jesus is in the life of the believer if we let the stuff of this world get on top of us and beat us down. And here's the conclusion. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, that's back up to the first verse. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. The finish is this. We receive the finish, the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. So your next bullet is this. It's pretty simple. As the finisher of my faith, Jesus is the future of my faith and the outcome of my faith. That's it. It's not stuff. It's not to go home and see my loved ones. It's, it's not any of that. I love the thief on the cross because it sums up and it deals with a lot of doctrinal issues too. I realize some of my brothers and sisters insist that you cannot be saved unless you are water baptized. Problem is the thief on the cross never was and you got to deal with that. And I've gone through this before. Let's do it again. There's two prepositional phrases in this verse. Jesus turned to the thief and said, Today you will be with me, with preposition, in paradise, in preposition. Don't get the phrases out of order. What's the point? Thief, today you're going to be with me, and I'm going to be in paradise. And so since you're going to be with me, you're going to be in paradise too. That's the goal. Not heaven, not a mansion, not a streets of gold and all this other stuff. That's not the goal. The goal for me is to live this life as well as I can fight the fight. And when I am gone, I will go home to be with Jesus because that's where I want to be even right now. But I'm not able to do it to the fullness that I want to because sin's still here. And I'm still here, stuck in me. Until this body dies and sin is finally gone, I cannot truly be who I really am in Christ. That's the outcome. That's the fin He's the finisher of our faith. We're going to go home and be with Jesus. That's the conclusion. That's the finish line. That's the checkered flag, not all the other stuff. And we're always going to be with him. And his spirit will always dwell in us. And he will always teach us the truth. And he will always supply, gosh, eternity is a long time, you know. And it will never get old and it will never get boring because we will be with Jesus. The third piece, we look unto Jesus as the one who endured the shameful cross of our salvation. And because of that example, we need to endure whatever life we're dealt. Because in Christ, we already know the outcome. We're going to be with Jesus. He wins, so we win. The battle, the war, the big picture is, is already fought. The conclusion is already secured. On the way to that victory, there's going to be a whole bunch of little battles, and those are going to cause scars and, I mean, some serious damage along the way. And that's okay because in the end, all of that will be taken care of. Because Jesus endured, 
I know that I can endure because he came to the conclusion and finished everything that is needed for my salvation. I'm assured that I will be saved. I don't have to be with, do you realize that 80% of all Christians believe they can lose their salvation? 80%? What kind of Savior is that? Gosh, that's not good odds <laughs> at all. Either he is the Savior and can save me or he is not. And he says in Scripture, I will save to the uttermost. Every single thing broken in my life and your life will be redeemed. Everything. There's not anything you can do to push him away that he will walk away from you. Although sometimes we feel like that. Oh, I crossed the line. Oh, homeboy, here we go again. How can God possibly forgive that? Because he says, I've got you and I won't lose you. I'll never cast you away. I will know not never. It's a triple negative in the Greek. I love that. I will know not never, ever leave or forsake you. I don't have to question whether he's able to save me. He is. And I don't have to question whether he is willing to save me. He always is. And I don't have to question that the outcome will be, well, I hope so. We need to know so, not because of us, but because of him, the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12.3, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. In other words, God took on flesh, holy God, and he had to live around sinful man his entire life and be killed by him. Contradiction of who he is. Holy God living among unholy people. Yet it didn't change him a bit. Lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. That's where some of us are right now. We have endured some things that are just beating us down unbelievably. And we don't know if we can make it. And we're told if we put our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher, we'll make it. He endured, we will endure. He won the victory, we will win, win the victory. I don't have to get lost in that. It's very easy when there's a major crisis in your life to get lost in your head, right? And God says, that's okay. You might be scrambled up here, but I got you. Everything's okay. I'm holding on to you. I'm not going to let go of you. Work through it with time, with my love, with my grace, with my mercy. You will survive. I've got everything under control. When I hear Christians say, this whole world's out of control, where did God go? I didn't know he left. It doesn't matter what I think is happening in this world. It is his world. He has always been in control, and he will always be in control because history is his story. It's about him, not about us. And in the end, he will have all of his purposes accomplished. Nobody can challenge God and change it. We're not serving equal evil versus good, okay? That would be Star Wars, okay, not not scripture. So because you're, you're first, because Jesus endured the shame of the cross, he is my hope of eternal life. Now, let me be clear. The shame that he endured is my shame. And the shame he endured is your shame. Our sin is shameful before God. But he became us. He became our sin. He became my guilt. He became my shame. That's why he had to die. He had to become us. Otherwise, there is no way out of this problem. Because he endured the shame of the cross, he is my hope of eternal life because my debt has been paid fully, completely. There is nothing that will be held against us. Well, what about the verse, well, everybody has to stand before God and give an account. Okay, one more time. My account will be, ask him. He's the Savior. He paid the price. 
for those who don't have Christ, they will have to give an account and they will have to pay for it. And the tragedy is that they didn't have to pay for it because Christ already paid for it, but they wouldn't receive it. The last verse in our last bullet. For he has made him, Christ, don't miss this. Jesus did not carry my sin as, as something extra in his hands. Jesus himself became us. Sinless God became the sinner. Don't miss that. The creator became part of his creation and became by choice, by design, by purpose, the sinful man who would die once for all, that we might find a way out. Otherwise, you're stuck. You're not only up the creek without a paddle. It's a whole lot worse than that. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here's, here's what happens, folks. And let me try to do it as simple as I know how. Christ in me. When I accept Christ, my life is hidden in Christ. And when the Father looks down, he sees Jesus, who is righteous and just and holy. God himself, the God-man. And me, because I'm still a sinner, every now and then I try to pop up and, you know, run the show. But God still sees Christ in me. And therefore, even though I'm a sinner, in Christ I am now the righteousness of God. I am holy, even though I'm still a sinner, and a pretty darn good one too. And in Christ I'm loved forgiven, sealed. This is, this is like glue. I mean, it cannot, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. Height, depth, breadth, width, all the other stuff that's in that verse. Nothing, nothing. You can't separate yourself from Christ once you are given to him. Good luck. I call this my daddy hold when my kids were little. I'd grab them like that. And, you know, this is usually in the parking lot, in the store, whatever, and I have another grip, too, that it's my daddy grip. And here's what kids do. So they're kind of dragging them through. <laughs> what, is, what needs to happen there? All they got to do is grab back on. That's where some of us are, I think. The struggles of life have us flopping around. Christ hadn't let go of you. He hadn't deserted you. He knows exactly what you're going through. He's got it all covered. He's waiting for you. Just in humility, grab back a hold of him, and he'll take you where you need to go. Otherwise, there's no way out of the messes in this world. I'm just telling you, there is no way. The last one is this, then, because... Jesus took my shame to the cross and your shame, my guilt and your guilt, my sin and your sin. His glory becomes my means of salvation. Only through the shedding of blood is there the forgiveness of sins. Not of goats, not of sheep, not of doves, not of all the other stuff, but the shedding of the blood of Christ the lamb slain from before the foundation. So my hope is this, that we understand a little bit better today Christ as the author, the cause, the beginner, the mastermind behind it all, and the finisher, the one who has run the race and, and won it and conquered death, conquered sin, become all the stuff that we cannot ever do in our own life to redeem us. And the simple question is this then. Is Christ the author and finisher of your faith? Have you accepted Christ? I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about doing stuff that, you know, religious stuff. If you have found yourself calling yourself what you really are, 
a desperate, pretty despicable human being, and you've admitted that to God, that's called repentance. And the other side of repentance is calling God who he is, the creator, the savior, the redeemer, just, holy, true. And when those two meet, God wins all the time. But if you've never had that repentance, which is acknowledging who you are and acknowledging who God is, then you're just stuck in religion. That's it. It's a surrender. It's an act of the will. It's a decision that you make, that you're going to give up yourself because God knows better. Give up your sin because he has taken care of it. Give up your life and deny yourself to find him. If you've not done that, nobody can do that for you. Only you can do it. And that is something very private and personal. But then when you do that, you become part of the body of Christ. And at that point, then we start being, becoming responsible to each other because each person has to do their part within the body. If you have accepted Christ, which I believe the majority of us have, but not necessarily all, then the question for us is, are we looking unto Jesus or are we just going to keep letting this world just sell us one more bill of goods and one more pile of junk and one more dead end and one more fear and one more loss? Final thought. In the number of years that I've been here, there have been couples that have come and they're struggling with the marriage. And I'll tell them up front several things. One is, I didn't break it, I can't fix it. Secondly, if you stop beating each other up, you might get out of this, but if you continue on, you're not going to survive it. That'll be the outcome, just telling you that. If you find yourself in that predicament and situation, whatever it is, I'm just using that as an example. It could be any one of another hundred things. The only way out of any of these struggles is God's grace and mercy. That's it. Otherwise, we're pretty much doomed. And we'll struggle for the rest of our life and deal with what, uh, what ifs and should haves and could haves and would haves. And, and we'll just always be having our faith beaten down. But if we keep looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, then no matter where you are, we're going to make it. And I got to tell you, very honestly, I have a lot of times in my life that I wonder if God hadn't you know, I've crossed some lines. That's what the enemy wants me to think because then that's it. I've had through the years times that I would like to get up and say, you know what, I'm no good, a rotten scoundrel, dirty rat, and all of that sort. So I quit and walk off. That's what I feel like doing from time to time. And yet God says, but that's not who you are. It's who you are in this world. But you're my righteousness. I've called you, I've redeemed you, I've given you a purpose, so do it. My dad told me that on his deathbed. He looked at me and said, Tom, you know what you're supposed to be doing. Would you just go and do it? And that was a very deep spiritual state. I don't think he knew what he really had said, but he understood and God spoke through him, and that was a turning point for me. So where are you in this? Let God Watch over you. Let him have your heart. Get your eyes set back on him and not all the other stuff that we deal with. Yes, we are concerned about our surgeries and our illnesses and the losses of life and, the, and struggling with finances. And We could fill a book. And Jesus says, doesn't matter. You're mine. I got you. Let's pray. Father, help us to understand a little bit more today as we walk out of this building how much you truly do care for us and love us, how you are the cause, the author of our salvation, how you are the one who brings it to a conclusion and consummates all things. You are the finisher of our faith. Help us to see through spiritual eyes in the eye of faith. Help us to know, Father, the struggles are real, and yet you have them all under your control. And as your children, you love us more than we can possibly understand. 
Help us to come into a renewed sense of relationship with you in the days ahead for this year that's coming up in 2020. Father, help us to be determined to love you more than we have in the past and get our eyes back where they need to be instead of on the stuff of this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to close with a song. As always, if you need to stay and talk or pray, need to greet people, you do that, okay? Guys, let's just sing that last chorus of the song that we wrapped up with earlier. More love. Take it to the top. Chris, we'll sing it all down. More love to Thee, O Christ, more love to Thee. Without the prayer I make on bended knee, this is my earnest plea. More love, O Christ, to Thee. More love to thee, more love to thee. One certain joy I craved, sought peace and rest. Now thee alone I seek, give what is best. So my prayer shall be more love, O oh Christ, to thee, more love to thee, oh, more, more love to thee. Sing the last verse. Then shall my latest breath whisper thy praise. This be my God in cry, my heart shall raise. This till my prayer shall be, more love, O oh Christ, to thee, more love to thee, oh, more love to thee, more love.